All right, we are live. Welcome everyone to another Talk and Tie live event. Um, again, thanks for everyone who uh, is watching. This is both available on my Phil Rowley Fly Fishing Facebook channel and my YouTube channel. And as most of you are probably aware, we are in the midst of fly tying at season. At least I am today. We were, if you're familiar with centigrade we were minus 21 which is really cold and uh so no fishing up here right now but tonight's live event is all about fly tying and in particular answering uh any and all questions we can in the next hour and change um and we've got a list of questions that those of you who saw the posts that uh we're out about this event all over different uh, social channels. We've got uh, close to 30 questions, so that's great. Really thank everyone who took the time to answer those questions. If we've got time, we will answer any additional questions or try to fold them into existing questions we've got. And if we can't, um, I'll do my best to answer the questions I can uh, in the comments section on either my Facebook or uh, YouTube channel. And I remind you to stick around because for those that pose questions tonight, the pre-broadcast, uh, um, our good friends at Canadian Lama have, uh, will be contributing a, a materials package and we'll be doing a uh, number draw for that, just doing a, a number generator and picking a number. But what really excites me tonight is my guest. Um, I've got to me, one of the world's premier fly tying uh, educators and master fly tire, Tim Flagler. And, um, you know, Tim is, um, what, what can you say about Tim? But he's probably one of the most active YouTube channels out there. He's got a fly tying uh, YouTube channel, totally focused to fly tying. He's a videographer by, by profession. So when I bring him in in a few seconds, you're going to see quite the difference between the uh, video quality I'm running and Tim's. Um, his videos are first class. Um, he just does a wonderful job, in-depth explanation of flies, fly tying, different techniques, and the detail and the, and the videography he uses to uh, illustrate his lessons are, are first class. He's got almost 100,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel and over 30 million views. So if uh, you're not aware of Tim's Tightline Productions video channel, Please drop by and take a look and, and be sure to subscribe. He's just about uh, 300 subscribers sly, sh sorry, shy of 100,000 viewers. So hopefully maybe tonight's event can push him over that impressive YouTube milestone. Uh, in addition to his channel um, and on his channel, you'll see other tips as well. He provides one-minute tying tips and techniques for Orvis. And he also does video tips and articles for Fly Tire Magazine. And he's a regular presenter at uh, fly fishing clubs and fly fishing shows, such as the uh, fly fishing show series of clubs across uh, North America. So it's an honor to have Tim here. And let's bring Tim in. Hi, Tim. Welcome to tonight's Hey, broadcast. Phil. Thanks for joining me. It's, it's just an honor to have you here. Oh, it's it's great to be here or wherever we are. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're somewhere we, out in the ether. No, we've got uh, people from all over, and, uh, you know, Tim's located in New Jersey. So, Tim, what time is it there for you? You are two hours ahead of me, so 9.15-ish? Yep, yep, yep. Well, so not quite your bedtime, but... Uh... Uh, pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is we, we've got a lot of questions here, and we're just probably the best way, Tim, is to dive in it. Tim has got a, a lot of... Uh, of his cameras set up so he can um, show a lot of the, the uh, techniques um, we're going to talk about tonight on camera. I've got a little bit set up as well um, for some of the ones um, that uh, Tim may not be familiar with. I can't believe that, but uh, I think, oh, I think Tim, you're doing that just to make me feel sort of. No, needed. no, no. Uh, <laughs> anything still water, that's you, Phil. Yeah, okay. All yeah. right. All right, so let's go with the first question. And there was a couple about this, all about the whip finish, the knot we use to finish flies. Um, you typically at the eye of the hook, but a whip finish can be applied anywhere along a fly. Um, so, Tim, why don't we, you know, the, the question was, I, I whip finish with my hand and with the tool, depending on the situation. Which method do we prefer? Uh, for for me, anyway, it's, um, it's the tool. I, I've, you know, learned to use the tool you know, 40 years ago, I guess, and, and have, have never really looked back. I can whip finish by hand. I just feel that the, the tool is a good bit more accurate. 
uh, in terms of wrap placement, which I believe is important. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I, I think anyway, I can keep better tension throughout the whip finish with the tool than I can with my hand. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm the same way. I can, I, I prefer to use the, the whip finish tool um, because it's more accurate. I think I have better placement with that, but um, I'm just going to bring this up big here so we can, uh, we can, uh, I'll just remember. Yeah, I just lost your audio, Phil. Well, I'm back here, but I'm just going to let Tim show you some whip finish tricks. Okay, yeah, when you cut to full screen and we lost your audio. Okay, just trying to make this, uh, yeah. let me play yeah, some views here. Yeah, that would yeah. work fine right there. So um, just a couple of things uh, with the whip finish. Different whip finish tools. Uh, Mattarelli is probably the most popular, um, my favorite. Uh, you can get larger ones too, and for for bigger flies. But uh, this is this is kind of the old standard. And what I what I like to do when I whip finish anyway is we'll just do a couple different ones. I'm gonna get my thread started here. And snip off that excess tag. So when I'm doing a hand whip finish. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so you can see the hand whip finish better. One of the tricks I use is when I do it, I, I start up like this with my bobbin up here. And as I'm doing the whip finish, I switch like this back and forth. And that keeps that knot very tight, which I like. Okay. Um, seat the knot. But what I'm going to show you with the regular whip finish tool, which looks got a lot of thread out, something like this. Very, very quick, but what it looks like close up, and th this is uh, to me what's kind of important, is to, to make a proper whip finish knot, you should always do it from back to front. And what I mean is start there, next wrap goes in front, next strap in front, next in front, and then one more. You know, four or five turn is usually really good. But what that does, you can see when I pull the thread through, it's underneath all those wraps. And it doesn't do that if you, you're not going back to front, okay? The other key thing with a whip finish is really seat that knot well. Brace the hook and, and grind it in there. Uh, and that way you put, put under a little bit of tension. I have a little chisel on the end of my whip finish tool. And if I just touch it, that, that tag goes back under there and just neat little whip finish. So for, for me, yeah, it is. It's um, the, the tool whip finish is a lot more efficient and accurate than, than a hand whip finish. That was, that was great, Tim. Really good. Wow. Great camera work there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Question two. Um, struggle with getting proper wing set on spinner patterns. Wings always slightly offset. Appreciate any off any advice you can offer. Yeah, wings spinners are gosh. Um, and and uh, most most of the spinners that I tie now, anyway, I, I'm using a, a poly wing, just uh, poly mm -hmm. yarn. Uh, floats well to me. Makes a nice little silhouette. Oh. Just, just um, I can get one started right on this hook shank as well. I keep them back a little bit, leave some space behind the hook eye. And this is a, this is a little tip I'll give to you guys for for now, for later. But one of the things when you're tying in any material that gets a little fussy, might be a little slippery, is I've just got just the smallest amount of rabbit fur dubbing. You you don't need much, and all you're doing is making a little landing pad for whatever material you're using. So very tight little dubbing noodle. You land right in the middle of it for these wings. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm polypropylene floating yarn. And I like the stuff that, gosh, it depends on which package you get. This has got a nice little like translucent shimmer to it. Uh, some of it doesn't. And just a card width segment. This is enough to make really to make two flies worth get started. I am going to remove a little bit 
You don't want them too thick. And so when I go back to, to, to get this seated, and I'm, I'm trying for the midpoint on the segment, but it's, it, it's not critical. We're going to even them up later. Uh, bind it down. But you can see, even with one wrap, just because that dubbing is there, it just grips in. It's not wanting to spin around the, the, the slippery hook shank. And gosh, for so many different materials that give you problems, that that little bit of dubbing is, is the solution. I'll, I'll, one of the questions that we're going to get later is, uh, is about uh, deer hair. And uh, that that's where it really helps. So to get the wings evened up nice, Usually what I do is I'll either pull them back and trim them off or pull them straight up and trim them off. And if you just start trimming, okay, those are still too big. I want them a little less than a hook shank in length. Just bring them up again, trim a little bit more, and they get down to about what I like. And I, I hope that answers the question. I mean, there's so many different materials you can use for uh, for for wings on spinners, and uh, you know the, the 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 polypropylene floating yarn to me is is really just the easiest and the easiest to get even and right. And that's such a great tip, uh, Tim, because you can use that for. Other, we were talking earlier about like uh, dumbbell eyes that you know I think a lot of people gravitate to using you know, a, a Kevlar thread or a GSP thread so they can really, and we're going to talk about thread in a second, about really pounding those wraps on, but that doesn't always work, does it? Because you just end up with two smooth surfaces. Right. Uh, and yeah, they're not, it's not bound in, they're they're tied in. I think the analogy you use, me getting ahead a bit, was a rubber band uh, versus string to tie a bunch of pencils together. Yeah, yeah. Any anything that has a, l a little bit of stretch, a little bit of give, is going to help you out. And yeah, when we talk about threads, I I do like a, th a thread that has a little bit of stretch to it. Unlike a GSP, mm -hmm. um, you know, GSP is great because it's so strong, but it, it just doesn't have the stretch and that kind of grippy, uh, like a bungee cord would have. You know, I I, mm -hmm. I think I'd rather. Uh, tie something to the roof of my car with a couple of bungee cords than than just straight rope, you know, going over it just because it's got that elastic stretch that holds it. So, yeah. um, okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Question three. A uh, question from a friend of mine, Frank. Uh, thanks for sending this in. Um, when dubbing, instead of making a dubbing loop, do you or Tim ever split your thread or maybe single strand floss to produce a full but thinly dressed dub body any tips or tricks appreciated so split thread dubbing tim well, that's i love yeah. to, i tend to use it with collars i know you just put out a, a recent uh tying tip uh you know using squirrel for a uh, uh, squirrel hair rather um is it hair or fur? It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got confused on that one too in the narration. Yeah. I yeah, I really and, don't know. Uh, anyway, um, and, and you use a, a split thread in that example as well. So yeah. maybe you can show people what, what that's all about and how easy it is to do and what a great yeah, technique me, it is. Let me see how close I can get here. That, that's I think that's pretty close. Um, so with, with if I'm using larger materials and, and I want a big bulky thing, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do a dubbing loop b before split thread. But if if I want it to be nice and subtle, I'm going to loop this back just, there we go. Nice and subtle. And this is UTC 70 denier, okay? Um, and you, it, it's much, much easier to do with 140 denier, uh, something thicker. A thread like Unithread, not great for it. Uh, the, just the structure of the thread doesn't allow it to be easily split, okay? But uh, a, a, U, um, a UTC thread, I'm going to show you in just a second. I'm going to spin my bobbin counterclockwise, okay? And I mean counterclockwise as if you're looking down on it. And what you should see starting to happen is that that thread should start to flatten out. I don't know whether you can see that on camera. But it, it's flattening out and becoming more and more flossy. I think you can see it there. Got some gook on my... Anyway, once you get it flossed out like that, you just take a bodkin and you can keep on going like that. Get it nice and flossed out. And then usually just split it. It doesn't have to be right down the center. 
I have a big old camera in front of me and makes it a little more difficult. But once you get that that open, those two strands open, uh, you're, you're pretty much good to go. What I like to do is just a little teeny bit of dubbing wax on there. Let me see if I have some dubbing somewhere. Sorry, guys. Anyway, just a little bit of dubbing. And here, I'm just going to take little slips. Stuff it in there. Not a whole lot. Okay? We're going real light here. Just a nice, fluffy little segment. Get that trapped. Zoom out so you can see what I'm doing here. And then it's just a matter of spinning the bob in the other way, clockwise, as if you're looking down on it. I'm going to spin it up. And you can see what happens that all that fur gets trapped in the in the in the thread okay keep on spinning and it, it's amazing how tough even utc 70 denier can be when it when it's spun up like that and sometimes you trap some fibers in there you can go in with your bodkin and and just pull them out make it real wispy real light and then wrap it almost like you would soft tackle, pulling the, pulling the fibers rearward as you go, make a nice little collar, whatever you want on the fly. Looks super, super buggy. And it, you know, unlike a, doing a dubbing loop, doesn't take up a whole lot of space, not, not a lot of bulk. And so you can make a real nice wispy looking uh, thorax, e even a collar, a fur collar. Does that, that help? Yeah, nope. I think I think that, <laughs> that's great, Jim. Again, yeah. the, the camera um, work is outstanding. Yeah, and, and again, you you can end up with something that's really really sparse, and because you use split thread and it's a, a narrow thread, you're not building up a lot of uh, uh, bulk with the thread. As you can see, right right at the head of the fly, it, it's you know you're down to really very thin strands. Works like a charm. I, I love split thread dubbing. Um, yeah. Yeah, it works great. I, I like using it on uh, on materials like CDC as well, or like you illustrated uh, in your video earlier this week with fur too, because you don't. Yeah. It allows you to get the hide out of the question, which builds up bulk, right? Right. Oh yeah, great. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the hide or the stem, uh, getting that stem off the CDC, uh, getting getting just the fibers spun up is fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, a question here, and I think we've answered that. Would the split thread work for soft tackle CDC as well? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah really um and that's great it looks so good on like euro jigs and stuff mm -hmm. uh, that that collar behind a tungsten bead is just awesome yeah and when you use it with like um you know the petajan magic tool or the swiss cdc tool now you can adjust your fiber length too which is always an issue sometimes with tying small flies and, and trying to find feathers appropriate size for that fly yeah i i didn't you know i really didn't feel like taking out a second mortgage to get one of those so uh <laughs> oh you got the, the, yeah, chip, yeah. Clip, the chip the clip. chip clip <laughs> oh, okay. um i i gotta get them someday though yeah. uh okay a question and as, as both of us are youtubers um Let's talk about keeping your hands in great shape for tying videos. And I'm going to leave oh, this to you because I am brutal at this. My hands, I, I tend to, I, I think I told Tim earlier this week, I decided to, I was doing some dishes and, and cut the tip of my thumb on a food processor blade, which as a left-handed person, cutting the tip of your thumb is, is both painful and everything you touch thereafter is always you lead with your thumb, it seems. So, so Tim, what are some secrets to keeping your hands all up? clean and appropriate well it's tough and and uh i mean i am i'm not an inside guy and so um do a lot of things that are rough on my hands and and i do i i wear i wear gloves almost for everything now um that i now that i've started doing these tying videos but but still keep keeping them and, and just fishing alone tears tears your hands up oh, yeah. stripe striper season i my they're just the salt water sand and and lines yeah. that you just don't stand a chance anyway um a, a couple things that i have found though guys is that if if i go and wash my hands uh, i preach this all the time before i tie really give them a scrub with a scrub brush and soap and warm water and dry them off 
I tie better. I tie more accurately, cleaner. I feel better about the flies. And it's always been that way for me. If my hands have the slightest little bit of oil on them, I just don't have the the, the touch that I do if, if they're nice and clean. Now, uh, other things you can probably see is uh, they just, by washing them all the time, they get all dried out and nasty stuff like that, which you know, gets, gets caught on tying thread and is kind of a nightmare. So, uh, moisturizers that you can use it here, a couple that, uh, they'd been suggested <laughs> to me because people see that my hang nails on video, it's like, you gotta get some moisturizer, Tim. Uh, the first one, interesting one, uh, uh industrial stuff called bag bomb. It's, it was originally meant, uh, for, for, uh, treating cow udders and it does, it has a very distinctive smell to it uh not unlike the cow on the, on the cover. I'll take your word for that <laughs> yep <laughs> fortunately we don't have smell vision here yep. and it, it is remarkable stuff but it does it does it's got a way about it let's just put it put it that way so uh the other one that I found is really good and I I I Put it on before bed it, it, it's it's industrial strength stuff you want to let it soak in and you don't want to really be doing anything uh well while it's soaking in is yeah. uh you know the the, the keeps o'keefe's and it re really remarkable um and so yeah just you know for for tying anyway guys just just keep your hands clean it, it really makes a big difference um uh, in terms of feel and and keeping materials i mean i i've done it when you know come in and racing to get some flies tied for the next day's guide trip. They didn't clean my hands and, and realize that, that, that cream dubbing is now tan, dark tan dubbing because I have a bunch of junk in my fingers that I ground into the dubbing. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And that'll make the killer fly. And you'll never be able to duplicate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, question here. It says, hi, Phil. I struggle with two items, choosing the right size hook for the fly and far too thick when doing dubbing brushes, no matter how I attempt reductions. Well, hook size is usually, you know, the, the pattern recipe often dictates it. Or if you're trying to imitate a particular food source, um, you know, check out how big they get and, and choose a hook to, to match that. Um, I, I hope that sort of answers those questions. That's sort of where I go. And, you know, and we do a lot of chronomid fishing, so our chronomid size ranges on in the West are... Um, 18 would be small, 18 2X, and then right up to we get some 8 2X, really big ones we christen bombers um, to do well. So we just, you know, usually I, I stick, you know, with, that, with those pattern ranges for that. So, Tim, anything else on that? that are... Well, no, I mean, hook size is, there, there are a lot of things involved, and pe people get so picky, and, and, you know, they'll go, well, well, that bug is technically, it's not a 14, and it's, it's not a 16, it's a 15. Yeah, and you go well. You're, you're talking about the hook, and it, it it's so if it's a 15, just tie the tie the body a little shorter on, uh, you yeah. know, a size 14 hook. And I, I've never really gotten the whole 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 thing with that that it has to be the exact size. And and we talked about it earlier in the day. I, mm -hmm. I I got to see Atlantic salmon flies this year that that were about size. 14s and they were tied on size eight hooks it was just yeah. way up at the front behind the eye and you know you you want a decent sized hook for the fish you're trying to land and and you know uh yeah a 14 a little fine wire 14 just isn't going to make yeah. it but uh they were eating small bugs so that's what you got to do yeah we do that with chronomids too because of the same reasons big fish tiny little you know less durable hooks and things straighten out and and so time i know and i know a lot of tires get all obsessive sometimes about rib numbers of ribs and proportions and things like that and yet this big hook is you know, right yeah. below and thankfully the fish miss that or this wouldn't be much of a tying uh, uh presentation i'd probably be doing golf or something um as for <laughs> dubbing brushes um when I use dubbing, you know, I love to use mohair blends uh, for leech patterns, balance leeches, things like that. Tim was gracious enough to feature one of my balance leeches uh, recently on his channel and use a little a less is more um, because the dubbing is a cumulative effect along the length of the loop. And I really like to brush once I've spun that loop um, with the materials in it tight. I really like to brush it out uh, almost so that 
the uh, dubbing itself is is really thick thread. The majority of the fibers are free and uh, almost like hackle fibers. And then you just wind it up and stroke them back out of the way and then aggressively brush it later. So if you're having trouble with dubbing brushes, you know, really reduce the quantity down. I use a an analogy that basically you can see through the dubbing. You could read um, a book, a page in a book through the dubbing. And you might go a little cross-eyed after a while, but, uh, um, you know, the dubbing, it, it's its not that much. Don't be putting big gobs of it in there. It just becomes unruly and, and, and goes off in its own direction. So that's some of the, hopefully that answer's there. Uh, NorCal Trout, thanks again. Excited for this, a couple of legends. Well, I don't know about that. Tim, for yeah. sure. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I like using 12 aught and 8 aught nano silk. And I wax the thread with venues to start it on the hook and then tie down a ramp of deer hair. When else should I use wax with GSP? That's a, there's a two, two questions here. Yeah, it, it's a good question. I, G, um, gel spun GSP is, is slick, slick stuff. And it doesn't have a lot of stretch to it. And, and so gripping materials with it can be tough. It, it's so strong, though. You're, um, you, you feel like you're, you're really locking it down because you're putting so much pressure on it but again it, it, it's slippery material and the the vineyards wax if if you guys um if people out there who, who are tying without the vineyards unfortunately i don't have a uh the 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 cover for it to show you what the label looks like but it, it's really remarkable stuff davy mcphail uh uses it a ton that he puts it a little little bit of it sticks on his fingers and waxes the thread all the time with it um, really amazing at, at gripping, but the um, with with the gel spun, it, it's I, I haven't found that the wax it adds a whole lot to gel spun. It, it's almost like the wax slips on the gel spun on the nano silk, um, and and so um, it, it can get a little tricky. Um, it does it definitely does help, but you you know you you still going to be slippery what one of the things that, that i found and I, I don't really have um any anything to support this but if you're if you're tying in a material and you're constantly slipping off that slope actually i might have it bear with me we'll just tie in a little bit of deer hair here I don't have any gel spun in a bobbin. Clean out the butt ends. Anyway, this this um you know this happens a lot. It happens with a lot of different materials. Um, you've got it locked down, and I'm gonna make a mess out of this, but we'll just go. And you're trying to. Uh, it's not going to work. Anyway, if you're slipping down and it's slipping off like this, don't try to start up here and work your way down. If you start low and kind of build up a dam as you go up and just step up going up this way towards the material, the chances of it slipping down that little slope are, are way less likely. Okay. Yeah. Does that make any sense at all to you guys? Um, I hope it, so. It's I just... Yeah, it's which direction you go, I, and, and I like taking wraps down closer to the eye, working my way up that ramp, as opposed to trying to take a, ramp, uh, a wrap at the top, and then it always wants to just slip down that smooth ramp. Okay. All, All right. right. Um, second part of the question was around uh, intruder wire. I know you like a lot of trout spay, Tim. Uh, yeah. With intruder wire, how do I keep the hook at the end of the wire loop? It wants to slide forward towards the shank. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I know exactly what they're talking about. It's that little, um, when, when you put a hook into a loop on the back of an intruder fly, it's that little, it's like a loop-to-loop -loop connection almost. Little, They call it a handshake knot, if you will. Mm -hmm. And be, because wire has just got some memory to it, even very thin wire, it still doesn't want to just crease and seat right in behind the hook eye and look good. It always, that hook eye wants to ride up just a little bit on the wire. And 
and that's okay. It's not affecting the the performance of the fly. It, it, it's not hurting anything. But visually, I I know that it it's not really appealing to the tire. Um, one of the things that I do is rather than using, I got a bunch of you know different intruder wires, and you you can try going a little thinner uh, if you like on the the intruder wire. Uh, some of this stuff, it's it's more like a cable. I don't know whether you can see that in there. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it's a little slinkier, I guess, than, than a heavier intruder wire. Uh, that helps. But what I've kind of gone to is, is using something like Berkeley Fireline, a uh, 30-pound test. And it's, it's a little bit heavier. It's got a, more of a coating than, say, something like Power Pro Braid, uh, even in 50-pound test. This, it's nice when you first start, but it tends to get limp over time. Uh, the, the fire line really holds its structure almost like wire, uh, but is much easier to seat behind that hook eye. Oh, great. That's a great tip, Tim. Yep. Great tip. All right. Uh, next, oh, bead question. Um, please chat a bit about when a metal bead is the best option for weight and when wrapping the hook shank with lead wire is a better option. Um. Well, I guess it depends, obviously, in the environment you're going to throw it in. You know, river and stream patterns, Euro nymphs, it's almost beads all the time, and tungsten, fair to say, Tim, to, to get those. Oh, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I'm to the point where if, you know, if I'm putting a bead on something, I, I want to make it worthwhile. And it, it mo nine times out of 10, unless I'm feeling really cheap that day, it's going to be, it's going to be tungsten. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, for the still water patterns I do, like my coronamids, I'm almost, almost exclusively brass because they're such thin bodied flies. They slice through the water pretty efficiently. And I know a lot of people fish primarily with indicators when using coronamids, but I use other techniques, long leader methods, uh, sinking lines with them as well. And, and the tungsten just sinks too fast because unlike European nymphing and river situations, I don't have the current to deal with um, that's going to, you know, negatively impact the sink rate of the fly. Um, lead wire um, or lead wire substitute now, um, I would use that more if in, in really clear situations on lakes where that flash of the bead could put a fish off or, or at least alert it and they want more subtle, somber presentations and I need a weighted fly, then I'd, um, you know, have a lead you know, traditional kind of a lead underbody with it as well. But you, you know, Tim and I, we were talking earlier, you got to be careful. Some of the hook style we use nowadays, particularly the curve shank looks like a scud hook, or two extra long nymph hook. When you weight those hooks, um, you end up inadvertently making that uh, the high point, that high, the hump of the, the hook, the heaviest spot. And that causes your fly to roll upside down when it gets in the water, because it's now the heaviest, densest spot and it causes the fly to roll over. So I, I think we've covered that. There was also a question here that, uh, Tim, about beads, uh, something you and Tom had been talking about. About Here it is. So it sort of fits in. We can squeeze this one in. I uh, heard you or Tom uh, say Rosenbauer. <laughs> yeah, Chuck, uh, both of us know Tom. So yeah, that's going to be his new nickname now. Um, yeah. Say you should use gold beads. Say you should use gold beads to not catch trout. What color bead? Um, yeah, Ro Rosenbauer is a, he's a black bead guy, black nickel finish on the yeah. beads. And, and so I, I have started using all different colors and, uh, kind, kind of into it. <laughs> and yeah. they, uh, yeah. it just makes flies look good, you know, yeah. it, and, uh, you know, an orange bead, let's face it kind of looks like an egg too. Um, yeah. and so, um, you, you can turn a Frenchie into an egg sucking Frenchie and, yeah. and, 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 uh, really, really, uh, get, you know, get some wild looking patterns and, and I, 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 I like them. If it was real clear water, I understand what Tom was saying. If it was, yeah. it was clear, clear and picky fish. Yeah. yeah. Something more subtle, but yeah, I know in still waters, you know, black nickel is probably my subtle, uh, uh -huh. like Tom does, but we use a lot of copper and gold and, Chart fluorescent chartreuse, fluorescent yeah. orange, fluorescent pinks, especially when fishing overcast days, deeper water or stained water where that fluorescence, um, because it doesn't 
get muted like other colors do at depth and reduce light, it, it pops and stands out. And I really believe that uh, rainbow trout in particular like orange. <laughs> it yeah. just works so consistently well all the time uh, on a variety of flies. It always seems to improve a fly to stick a fluorescent orange bead on it sometimes. Oh, ab- absolutely agree. Yeah. I'll also, I'll, I'll give a plug for gold. Uh, you know, yep, one of, one of the most effective trout takers of all times is, is probably a gold map spinner you know yeah <laughs> and so a little little shiny gold never hurts anybody no they like jewelry too i guess yeah yeah uh, <laughs> yeah okay with so many thread choices available now what are your favorites uh tim you use it uh, noted yeah. you use utc a lot in your videos yeah i do and uh, the the reason for utc is uh huge range of colors which i love i i, I do uh, although it's probably not necessary, I, I like having a range of colors to choose from, and, and they have a huge range. Uh, the other thing, and you know, we kind of saw it at the beginning, is is cording and uncording the thread. And so, what there there are a couple things uh, that UTC does better than just about any other thread, and the, one of them is cording and uncording. And so, what I mean by that, I can't stand not having the hook level. <laughs> well, um, still not level. There we go. Let's see if we get a little better focus there. Anyway, if this this thread right now is pretty much uncorded, it's nice and flat. And so if you take wraps with it, they're just these nice, smooth wraps. Now you have to keep in mind, every time you take a turn like this around your hook shank, you are cording the thread up. I know that's a little hard to get your head around, but if you want to keep taking those flat wraps, counterclockwise spin that uncords the thread just a little bit and you can keep on wrapping okay nice and smooth the counter to that is if i clockwise spin my bobbin again as if i'm looking down on it you can probably see the thread it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller it's also developing a little bit of texture that you might be able to see and so you've strengthened the thread you've made it much much thinner and you've given it a little bit of texture. And so for tying in materials, uh, that works great. As I'm going back, I'm actually cording it up more with each each wrap, it, it's getting tighter and tighter. But if I wanna go and I wanna smooth that body out as I'm going forward, I'm gonna uncord. You can see that thread just flatten or floss out. And then I can take that and go back and just go over all that stuff Occasionally give it another counterclockwise spin, keep it nice and flossy. And so to me, the UTC just has has that versatility to it. It's reasonably strong. Uh, it comes in, in um, 70, 140, uh, 280, and I, I think 360 or 380 denier. So it gets very, very heavy. Um, yeah. I, I will say, though, that um, some of the some of the newer threads and i'll include uh the nano silks uh yeah, in like that those. yeah for for small flies the the you know the the 18 aught nano silk is just i mean it's a game changer it yeah. really and truly is it's so small and so ridiculously strong uh the other one that, that i like as well not not really in the same it's not definitely not a gel spun and it really doesn't floss out as well as UTC, but it's the Vivas threads. And they, I, I have a spool of eight aught somewhere. I just couldn't find it. But, but you know, 10, 16, 12, and, and 16 aught. And the this stuff, in terms of tying midges, is just un, unbelievable, uh, yeah. the 16 aught. And, and user-friendly, too. Uh, the, the, the gel spuns or the, the nano silks can be a little rough to cut with scissors. Uh, I tend to use a razor blade with them, uh, but these cut real nicely with scissors and just just do a lot that's right. So we we as tires uh, nowadays have just some incredible options. And it's only in probably the last 10 years or so that, that we've yeah. really gotten those those thin, super strong threads. And, and wow, uh, yeah, changes a lot of things. Particularly yeah, when, I, when I started out, we had Danville's. And then yeah. Uni came yeah. on board, and then now you've got those, and, and TechStream has got some great threads. And I think mine is usually decided by what I'm trying to do with the with the material and the colors sometimes, because the color, you know, particularly in my neck of the woods, thread body coronamids are really 
popular a technique um, uh, blended threads where you use a darker color as a base layer and then you'll take um, UTC is popular for this take a lighter colored thread and then you do what you're doing there Tim spin it out and floss it out flatten it and then sort of even zigzag the, the bobbin a little bit so that the the strands actually start to splay out like this and you you kind of build up layers that um, you know kind of a taper to it and layers and when you coat that fly the um, base color underneath bleeds through and gives kind of unique, um, you know, it goes from red to more red and then into a little bit if it was light olive and then ultimately into dark olive. And it's quite a neat, a neat, a neat technique. Neat, neat thing. Yeah. 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 Sounds, I'm not sure. Yeah. The, I, I, I'm not going to argue. I'm not sure the fish, if they know, again, back to our original discussion, if they notice that kind of detail, um, please explain the whole hook thing. So <laughs> um, next question is about trying to tie the atoms. Um, you know, unfortunately, time doesn't permit to tie one, but I did dig out a, a picture. Um, I've got a picture here I want to show um, of the of the atoms here. Uh, where's it gone? There it is. And um, sort of share this view. And maybe, Tim, we can talk about probably proportions is the biggest thing to keep in mind with any dry fly. So it floats properly, doesn't fall on its head. Um, yeah, per per. Proportions, super important. Um, the thing, though, with the, the atoms, and gosh, to, to me, to me it, 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 it uh, transcends just the atoms. But one of the things that really makes it is, is that combination of brown and grizzly. There's something about that that together those seem to form one magical material. And I've tried tying atoms you know, just with grizzly hackle, just with brown, not mixing fibers in the tail. Maybe it's a confidence thing for me. I just, I don't think they work as well as a, as a traditionally tied Adams. Uh, yeah. e well, either a parachute or a Catskill style. I think you do have to mix. And the other one are those grizzly hackle tip wings. And they, they are a dog to get right. And a lot of it's having the correct hackle tips uh, yeah. to, to do that. And I think... You know, it, it's great that we have these modern hackles, the, the genetics. It's just incredible uh, as compared to what you or I started tying with. But one one of the things that's been bred out of, of the birds are seems like good hackle tips. Everything comes to a, a, a like a serious point at the end mm -hmm. of, of the feather. And yeah. I, I do have um, this. This is one of my gosh, I promptly lost it. Um, this is one of those materials that that I just I I should keep it in a locked box somewhere because I've never never seen anything quite like it and you, you can tell I've used uh, pretty much all the 14s and 16s out of it. Um, I got a few 14s, um, but anyway, I'm gonna see how close I can zoom in here. Actually, I'll use the other camera to zoom in. It has got these rounded little mm -hmm. hackle points on it that are just, um, they're almost squared off and they just make the perfect, perfect uh, um, Adam's wings. And uh, every, everything about them just works. They're they're easy to tie in. They're easy to split. And and I I guess when it runs out, I just won't tie any more Adam's anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, the parachute atoms, you know, we were looking for, it was funny because Tim and I were both looking for an example to show out of our fly boxes and all we had was parachute atoms. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've got a similar cape, but it's a, uh, for my atoms, I used to like to tie them with a hen, a hen cape because I really like just a more rounded, it's just a personal preference. And, and when I was taught to tie dry flies, it was, um, you know, obviously get the hook and device, cover the front half of the hook with, with thread. And then bring that thread back up to the hook eye. So now you're sitting at that three quarters or 75% point. That's where your wings would go in. Then you tie in the tail. Then you dub the body to the halfway point. And then you tie in your hackles. And so they occupy sort of that front half and your wings divide them perfectly, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but they are proportionally, um, you know, years ago when I used to tie commercially, I thought my niche would be I would tie dry flies. And this was before we had... Uh, any decent quality, you know, I think Metz was one of the first fly tying companies that had decent quality. And then of course, Hoffman's and now Whiting and now uh, Keo and there's so many other, you know, there's a few other great ones. I know, Tim, you've got, what's the hackles you like to use? 
uh, the si- Sidling Hill, my buddy yeah. Evan Evan Brand out in Pennsylvania, and he's he's uh, he he's um, t- kind of working with uh, Charlie Collins bloodline, which is in terms of tying Catskill style flies. Charlie Collins just had had this stuff for years and years, yeah. and, and uh, I know Evan's working with him a bit and getting some of his birds and bloodline. So yeah, neat, neat stuff. It's not absolutely you know mechanically perfect, um, like say a whiting, but it has a ton of character to it, which I really like, yeah. uh, particularly for cat skills. Um, yeah, well, we were about that. I, I do have that one picture. Yeah, let's, let's show that show. picture. You told me that was yeah, beautiful. It, it, in, in terms of the proportions um, for a true cat skill style dry fly, the and it's why the proportions are so important. Um, you you can see that the the hackle points uh, are just touching on, on the vise that and the the tip of the tail is just touching bent up a little bit, and also the very bottom part of the 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 hook uh, at the bend should actually be a little bit above. Um, it's kind of sagged down there a little bit. Yeah. It should actually ride uh, above that that plane, and so in, in on the water surface, the the tail and the tips would dimple enough, and then the the hook would actually dimple as well, and get it to ride up high the way a natural insect would. And so, again, yeah, very very important. I, some of you guys might notice a little space behind the hook eye. Uh, that's kind of tradition for a real traditionally tied cat scale fly. They had that uh, space for a turtle knot, which was very popular. Um, so a lot of guys stick with that, but they're, they're just, they're, they're gorgeous flies uh, they are. when they're, when they're tied with the correct proportions. And, and, I know uh, when I come you, out East and, and uh, to the fly tying symposium every year um, and still a lot of traditional cat scale tires out there and it's, yeah. those flies are just works of art. Um, oh, they, such they a are. simple looking fly, but they just got such delicate, and they just look so tied properly. They just look beautiful. Yeah, and, and um, kind of kind of amazing too. How how even with the exact same proportions, the different guys have different styles, and, and he, you can really pick it out, and it's noticeable. I, I love them. Yeah, love, love them. Uh, another question here from Cole Young. Uh, what's your favorite Karani Karana mid coating? I struggle with U, UV resins. Um, changing thread color too much makes it too dark um depends on for me it depends on the the material i'll use a uv resin like solar res or um or there's lots of them out there uh you know if i'm doing mylar bodies but yes um you can affect thread color um when you put coatings on them other coatings to use are uh, brushable super glues are popular uh good old sally hansen's hardest nails nail polish i know you're a fan of that that stuff tim um, and I know some tires to really stop it, you can buy a, a fixative that uh, rod winders use, um, and put that on the fly first, let it dry. And then that protects the, the thread from, um, being influenced by the, the, the uh, final coating. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's always a challenge, um, to, to do that. So you might try that, uh, rod, um, uh, rod makers, the fixative they use on their thread wraps when they're wrapping guides would be something. Anything else, Tim, you think there to stop thread from being influenced by resins and yeah. glue? No, not really. Um, yeah, just, just experiment before you, you know, you, you commit to, <laughs> to two dozen flies, yeah. you know, <laughs> get, yeah. them, get them all tied up and then coat them and, and have things yeah. go to. Trouble is half the time, sometimes that'll be the perfect thing, but because the, the, imp, the, uh, it influences it different every time. You know, you're going to be yeah. chasing for your lifetime trying to match it again. Um, I think uh, Reese flies YYC. So YYC is the uh, an acronym for Calgary. Um, we talked about favorite threads. So hopefully we answered that. Um, question here about sunglasses for work. And not really a fly tying question, but uh, you have any sunglasses preference, Tim? Polarized glasses? Yeah, I, actually, I, I, I really do. Um, I'm... Uh... Well, I, I mean, good good glasses, Smiths, uh, Costas, uh, you know, Maui uh, gyms. Yeah. Maui gyms. Yeah, bad glasses are not good for your eyes, and yeah. it 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 stops you from squinting, and as a result, um, and they don't have the protection for UVAs and UVBs, and those things damage your eyes. So, uh, as as good as sunglasses as you can find, I wear them from sun up to sundown during the season. Mm -hmm. um a couple of the new ones um uh both both smith and and uh costa have them they're they're made for low light 
okay and i i think it's um the the smiths or chroma pops but the i know that the um costas are sunrise silver amazing uh that they're polarized and at the same time you can you can wear them till well after dark i forget to take them off you know um for me also with um i I have uh contact lenses and so it's why i'm wearing magnifiers now and you you can get glasses with magnifiers built in both costa and smith do but Mm -hmm. i'm going to tell you the little they're they're ones they're not very expensive um little lenses you can buy anywhere from 1.5s all the way up to 3.5s and they stick on on the inside of the lens just with water Mm -hmm. and hold remarkably well uh i am really really happy with uh those things so um those would be my tips for sunglasses okay well that's great i don't think i can add anything to that um it looks like somebody beat me to it uh jason basher asked but my question is what's the best way to finish a small fly i think we the whip finish i think we sort of covered that off i can't think you got another method to use on really small flies i just oh i i I wish i could still do it phil and and that's um just on a bodkin the smallest amount of suit don't even whip finish um do your last wrap barely make a head on the fly and a drop of UV cure resin on there and hit it with the light, cut the thread off. It keeps the head so nice and small and it's not going to come undone. It's a yeah. thing of beauty. Um, but, yeah, I've uh, not, yeah. I've used also brushable super glue prior to building the head, put that on the thread, wind it, you know, build your thread and then stop and then just remove it. Let the thread set, let the glue set and, and it holds. It holds. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, when, when finishing flies, again, whip finish question. Let's assume a uh, size 14 nymph uh, for this question. How many whip finishes do you normally do, and do you have a preference for head cement versus UV, UV resin over the thread wraps? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, really just four to five turns um, yeah. for, for my whip finish. Three to five, and that, I that, yeah, that, that to me is enough to, to – I know some guys do as, as few as two – um, I like to have a bunch of wraps over top of that one that comes back that you're mm-hmm. you're pulling back on, yeah. and so four, four to five is fine with me. I I do like, uh, you know, Sally Hansen just to seal everything up, let it soak in, and uh, as many many people know, I I have developed a sensitivity to the UV cure resins. I I I love them. I love working with them. I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. I just too much exposure. Yeah, you get uh, sensitized to it. I tend to use yeah. a lot of the brushable super glue, you know, build it up and then just whip finish and done. And it's it's an adhesive. It's super glue. It's it holds. So, yeah. um, Mr. Fox, nineteen seventy two asks, best way to stop crowding the eye on your hook. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's so much when you're easier. Out, you know, when you're first starting to tie flies, it oh, seems it's straightforward enough, but, uh, it, yeah, yeah, it is the, the curse of even intermediate tires. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what, what I do and I can, I can show it on camera. Um, actually, let me just cut this stuff off. We'll get started again. Um, razor blades and exacto knives are, are real Greatest handy thing. for, yeah for doing that. So I establish, I, I call it the no tie zone and I do it right at the beginning of the fly. And it's, I always cheat. I make it a little longer than I think I should. Yeah. And I go, okay, the, in, while I'm tying this fly, there are going to be no materials that get stuck in there until I go to whip finish period. Um, and if, if you start, start doing that, um, it, it really helps you to, to keep away from that hook eye um, and, and keep that zone clear until the final yeah. wraps. That's the same thing I do. I have that little no-go zone, and that's strictly reserved for, for building the head and finishing the fly. Nothing goes yeah. there. Um, how to tie a perfect zebra, Midge? Okay. That I can do, I think. Well, okay. Well, Is that okay? Yeah, by all means, tie away. Um, let me I think... Let me put materials together here somewhere. There we go. Zebra midge. Unbelievable pattern, guys. To me... Yeah, a lot of our coronamids are, you know, you could argue, are just larger zebra midges. Um, thread body and wire wire ribs. Um, using 
a lot of different materials, integrating flashaboo and anti-static bags and window tint film. And, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, you'll have to come out here, Tim, and we'll oh, I, show I'd you. I'd love to, Phil. Yeah, show how crazy it's become in a good way, not in a bad way. It's fun. It's the to me that's a celebration of the art of fly tying and just part of the fun of this all. The the addiction you and I and everybody else here tonight seems to suffer so heavily from. Addiction? Well, I guess it is an addiction. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and tying is our therapy. <laughs> so I'm not going to make this uh, really, really small. Size 18, little curved shank um, hook, uh, mer merger hook, if you will. I always find that if I'm working with hooks, this small plunger style hackle pliers really help out. Now, I have some small, they're 5664. Uh, little little beads here and a lot of times because i got them in hackle pliers the, these beads do have a, a small side and a large opening yep. and so i can generally get them on there just just by dipping them in then you get this thing closed up because they want to go shooting everywhere <laughs> that's for that sure before. that's then, a great tip with the hackle pliers especially on the yeah side. yeah so bead bead roughly matches. Uh, you can go a little smaller, a little larger if you wanted to. But one of the, one of the keys to me with zebra midges is is is, uh, is getting the body right on them. So I've got um, this is UTC seventy denier again, and one of the reasons I like it it cords and uncords really really well, and that's key to key to getting the body right on a on a zebra midge. I will say, and a lot of people. Uh, when they're feed her to the fire and somebody says, what, what kind of, you know, what are the two best flies to, to fish with? And I'm going to come right out and say it. If, you know, if I had to feed my family on trout, um, two flies that would probably be on there all the time would be a Frenchy nymph with a zebra midge trailing behind it. Um, it, it just works for me year round, uh, just about everywhere. So, but I am kind of picky about my zebra midges. I want to get that thread started. Let's see if mm -hmm. I get that center just a little bit better. Go all the way down into the bend. Um, you know, midges, yeah. midge larvae are generally fairly long. I'm not really worried about cording and uncording the thread at this point. And I do want to try to keep this fairly smooth. So I'm making even wraps back up. But... What I'm going to do, kind of the secret here, is I'm going to take my tying thread and I'm going to wrap one third of the way down. Okay. I know this seems really repetitious, but then I'm going to wrap all the way back. Take my tying thread, go two thirds of the way down, and then all the way back. Yep. And that's then, how we tie coronamids too, thread body coronamids, that same, same thing, that same table. pattern. And then yep. also we were counter spinning the bobbin a lot too to flatten the wraps to keep things nice and skinny as well. Yeah. So I, I you know, I haven't counter, I haven't spun the bobbin. Now I'm going to unspin it uh, or counter, counterclockwise spin it. Yep. And that's going to flatten it out and just allow me, I'm going to be kind of careful, um, uns, uncord it quite a few times as I go up here and just fill in. See the problem is I it it's so much bigger on on video than it is in real life. Yeah, <laughs> and it's probably looking horrible on there, but um, to me, with my naked naked eye, just a little magnification. So I get it, <clears throat> it you know, reasonably tapered. But the reason to have it smooth is is actually so when you take wraps with the wire. It, the, the thread wraps beneath it aren't influencing where the wire lands. In other words, if you are real lumpy on those, on those thread wraps, you know, if you put this on top of one of the hills, it would want to fall down into one of the valleys. Yeah. That makes any sense. Well, and so just kind of uh, nice wraps like that going all the way up. I do take a few more behind to brace the bead. Mm-hmm little thread collar and because it's a very small hook i do like to bring my bobbin up uh and support a, the hook yeah yep support the hook keep the stress off and then 
just find your whip finish tool and little four turn one two three four try to go back to front seat the knot well work it in there and snip it free i know i just got a little out of focus there sorry about that and then just the teeniest teeniest drop um, any little thread collar like that is vulnerable and I've, I've had a lot of if i don't put the sally hansons on there um i've had those thread collars come undone and yeah. so yeah that's that's, that's my that's my yeah. zebra midge and that's you know tim when we tie larger coronamids uh for our still waters we're you know essentially doing the same thing we may be using mylars uh for the ribbing or mylar and ribbing um i know a lot of guys like to to do that to create a shadow to you know further enhance the body segmentation it's it's uh, pretty impressive to watch how some of the tires are, are doing that because there's a question here about um two questions here we can bring in do you ever use flat wire for a rib or when i uh, no i i i um uh... I'm not sure I've seen flat wire really. There's a company called Sabai, S Y B A I, uh, European company. They're, they've got a flat ribbing uh, coming out, and I know some tires are um, using that. And it's 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 uh, it's it's got some interesting applications. Yeah, and, <laughs> can't wait to get some. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. writing a list here. Yeah. Um, and then best hook size for a midge. Well, I guess it depends where you are, because coronamids where I fish are midges. Right. And, uh, right. but, yep. but they're big, um, our still water ones, like I said, 18s to eights sometimes, um, and two XL in some instances, whereas of course your, the waters you fish out East there, a midge is teeny. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we get in the habit of calling anything really small a midge, which is, it's not a great, great habit to be in. Um, yeah. and yeah, but ours are anywhere from le legit size 32 or, yeah. or smaller, um, and may, maybe the largest ones we get here are, are 22s, but um, yeah. not much bigger than that. Okay. Uh, question here. What scissors do you use for cutting, for close trimming next to your coronamid bead head? So any kind of close trimming. I like the, the fine point scissors. I use the Dr. Slicks uh, fine point. I know you can use an X-Acto knife, uh, razor blades, uh, just to get that close cut. So the, you know, the thread, there isn't a tag sticking out, uh, but just fine point or i know a lot of guys you mentioned the razor blades or exacto knives as well you could use too yeah yep um in particular the uh the the double the double-sided razor blades that you'd use for like shaping deer hair are mm -hmm. insanely sharp and uh you do you do have to be careful but they they will trim off so so close uh yeah and they're they're super super thin yeah yeah uh okay uh let's keep going with these questions here because we're we're on an hour but i think we're gonna go for a while yet so uh, again if people do have to go we certainly understand it um you know tim and i will talk fly time until the wee hours i think <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, keep in mind this is being recorded so it will be available to watch in its entirety as soon as we finish here tonight both on my phil roley fly fishing facebook page and my YouTube channel, and I'm sure Tim will share it to his social channels too. If uh, I continue to be nice to him, which of course I will be. <laughs> um, MB Angler, halfway through my new book, The Orvis Guide to Stillwater Trout Fishing. Thank you for buying that and support. Um, question for you Do you choose a brand of hook you are tying on based on the pattern you're tying, uh, i.e., Daiichi for Coronamids, Mustad for Leeches? Um, I do tie a lot on Daiichi hooks, um, you know, primarily what I like about them and there's other brands of hooks out there as well is just the availability of the different styles. Um, probably Tim and I both grew up uh, tying flies on mustads originally, I think, and it was, we were talking about it earlier, it was a 94840 dry fly, a 3906 or a 3906B, a 9671, 7273, and maybe a 9674 in the trout sizes. Anywhere from standard shank to four extra long, and that's all you had, right? And nowadays we're spoiled with the hook styles and barbless hooks and jig hooks and so many hooks at our disposal. So I, the reason I tie with the Daiichi now is just the wide range of um, pattern, you know, hook styles in the range and the, the quality of the hooks, the hook point, the strength of the hook, the wire, all that good stuff. Yeah. 
Because Tim, you've got some per- preferences hooks you like to use too, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 I do like value hooks. I, I'll, I'll admit it. I, you know, I tie a lot of flies, and I, I guide, and I burn through a lot of flies. So value, you know, quality hooks at a decent price are important to me. And yeah. and um, and and so that fortunately there are quite a few of them on the market. But then again, I also I I, um, I, I like to tie flies that look good, and and so there are times when I'll go and and really tie for that sexy look you know that yeah. that really good looking bend or black nickel finish and and barbless and and just just looking really cool so yeah. and spend the extra money to do so yeah i think a lot of fly tire we gravitate towards those curved shank hooks there's something about them whether yeah. it's a bartley's atlantic salmon hook or a oh. scott oh. pupa hook right? yeah. oh. <laughs> he's okay? still my beating heart <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Jolene asked, um, need help identifying some easy to learn trout flies using only synthetic materials, um, something successful that beginners can use and be excited about. So you were talking about a green weenie. Was that what yeah. you were yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome fly. It's, it's, uh, I think I can tie one fairly quick. I hope I can tie one fairly quick. Um, nice, big, big hook. <laughs> And, and sure synthetic materials. Well. Yes, synthetic you materials. You talk about those while you get set up. No, just again, you've got um, consistency of dye lots. For you know, within the the dye path of that material at that time, there are always variances, of course, when you dye materials, but uh, readily available um, as opposed to natural f- fibers, which can be sometimes hard to find and and don't always take dye consistently as some of the synthetics do yeah and, and also you know just w- whether it's fur or hair feathers whatever it is just just in inconsistencies between the individual you know and the the material is going to behave differently so yeah. um, the synthetics kind of take care of that and just more uniform so i have a nice big size eight hook this pattern happens to work well that big mm. um l- larger thread uh UTC 140 denier, uh, much easier to work with than, than even 70 denier. And then j- all this all this fly is, is it's uh, most of the time it's like fluorescent green chenille. It can have a little sparkle in it if you like. This is a great, great fly uh, for, for getting kids to tie. And uh, you can see how that hook's going to dwarf the, the poor little zebra midge. Um, but Anyway, we'll get him out of there. Yeah, there's there's just nothing hard about it, and it does produce. We have a guy here on my local river who fishes uh, green weenies almost year round and fishes them really, really well too. He he's kind of humbling fishing next to the guy. Anyway, all it is is leaving a little space behind the eye, just like we were talking about that no tie zone, snipping off the excess tag securing i like to go to the top of the hook shank if i can to keep it on top of the hook shank i pull the material up and toward me and that way those thread wraps that want to push it to the far side aren't going to be able to okay i'm stopping it from doing that take wraps all the way back to the start of the hook bend which is generally on most hooks is somewhere about halfway between the hook point and the barb if you can't really see the hook bend key to the to the uh to the green weenie is a little tail just a little loop that's all you have to do of tying thread get that locked down i like to take a few wraps around the material and then just take a couple around back around the hook shank then a couple more around the material just keeps everything locked on top i'm going to return my tying thread back up there and then it's just a matter See, that wanted to spin, but we got it locked down. Really, I, I mean, anybody can tie this fly and and then go out and, and actually catch fish on it. Um, yeah. Hand fish, ba- bass, trout, um, anything will eat a green weenie. There you go. Snip the excess off and fish them subsurface. Uh, the guy who does so well here 
actually drags them on the water's surface, just like it was a little water skier making a little V wake behind it. And the, the wild brown trout cannot resist these things. And doesn't take too long to tie. That little tail moves a little bit in the water. Green weenie. <laughs> That's great. That's simple. And then all synthetic. <laughs> what was the body yeah. material on that, Tim? Um, it just just chenille, just uh, medium medium size fluorescent chartreuse chenille, and mm -hmm. then sh chartreuse, one hundred forty denier tying thread. Simple. Yeah. yeah, that's excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. There you go. Simple Dirt. <laughs> synthetic fly. Um, got a question here. Looking for some Camaronamid emerger patterns to tie. So my time to show off my embarrassingly inferior video equipment here <laughs> um but uh um i'll bring it up i'm just going to change cameras here and uh so this is uh one of them here I'll, I'll just uh sort of take tim out for a second this is a a lot of the emerger patterns i i tie are based on what sort of phase the trout are feeding on, on the coronamids on the surface, if they're coming up to feed on the surface, which in lakes is always a special thing because they do most of their feeding subsurface. But a coronamid will basically elevate its way up to the surface, then hang in a, a, a bit of a curve, like a comma, and then it'll sort of lay horizontal, then the split will form, it'll crawl out, uh, momentarily pause on the surface, and then sort of fly away. So this, this fly here is called a raccoon. It was a fly I first... Uh, saw in a video by a gentleman by the name of Paul Lasha. He did uh, Mastering the Midge VHS, for those of you who remember those. And it's just a simple fly that uh, it's got a hackle tip for a tail. You could use teal or mallard or poly yarn and mark it with a marker. It's got a little white ostrich hurl uh, that imitates the white, the pronounced white gills of the coronamid. And then the elk hair on the, as a shell back, or you could nowadays use a two millimeter foam and then peacock, or this is ice dub, or you could use a dry fly dubbing like fly right or frog's hair or something like that. And this imitates, um, this part represents the, the shuck of the, the pupa the, that's now cast. And then this is the adult that's just pulled out and uh, has yet to sort of open its wings. So that's called the raccoon, and that's worked really well for me at times. Um, the English style flies, uh, I believe this is like a Bob's Bits. It's just dubbed seals fur. You could use a synthetic dubbing like uh, um, uh, dime ice, uh, diamond ice dub and uh, just dub it. It's got a little bit of a tag on there for a little attraction. And this fly sits right in the film, uh, a damp fly. And you can also retrieve it back. A lot of times I'll fish these with like a midge tip line where the, line, the, the uh, fly will stay on the surface for a while. And then the midge tip will eventually pull it under. And as soon as this fly disappears, I start hand twisting it back just to track that fly just beneath the surface. And you get kind of a two for one presentation. So that's an option uh, to imitate a um, chronomid suspending at the surface. This is a clink hammer style fly. If I can stop dropping it uh, I, out of my first book, uh, Fly Patterns for Still Waters. It's now uh, just out of print. But this is a parapupa. So it's like a clink hammer, and, and as a fly fisher, you get to see this on the surface, a nice high-vis wing post, but this portion of the fly, uh, the thorax and body down here, is now suspending underneath to imitate a pupa that's hanging just below the surface. Uh, this is another one that imitates that style. I'm going to put it in the vise, not how you tie it, but how it sort of sits. This is called a shuttlecock. It's an English pattern. Again, a dub body of seal's fur. Uh, you could use... Uh, tail fibers, things like this, but this is just a tuft or two or three, depending the bigger the fly, the more you might put two or three um, tufts of uh, grizzly, uh, sorry, CDC plume in here. And then this, again, this would be the water level here with my dubbing needle. And then this body hangs underneath. So this is a very effective fly when they're, you know, feet focused on the, with the pupa just hanging below the surface. And then this is another pattern that I like to, to tie. It's a, uh, Bristol hopper, another English pattern. Um, it's uh, gangly. It's not a hopper like a grasshopper. Um, it imitates, it could be a terrestrial, um, you know, a, a, um, a coronamid or other insect that didn't quite get through, get stillborn, got uh, died in the process of trans, you know, um, transferring from one stage to another. It's just a cheap Indian cock hackle in front 
dub body and knotted single strand or double strands of pheasant tail knotted. There's some good videos. I think David McPhail, who um, Tim alluded to earlier, shows a video on how to tie um, a hopper like this. But you can buy, I know from Canadian Llama, you can buy pre, uh, you know, buy pheasant tail already pre-knotted for you. So um, somebody's already done it for you because knotting single or double strands of pheasant tail takes a little bit of practice. So those are some of um, chronomid, uh, um Emerger patterns you can try uh, out there, um, but uh, just to give you a cross section, and those some of those are on um, on my YouTube channel already. I know the hopper is, the raccoon is. Uh, I haven't done the shuttlecock yet, or the the uh, Bob's bits, or the um, but there's lots on there. If you follow some of the English uh, tires um, that are out there too, um, they have them up there as well. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of some of the things. But again. Tim, like any emerger situation, it depends what they can get picky on what sort of stage they're feeding on the nymph yep. just below the surface. The nymph half transitioning as it's just crawled out uh, cripples. And, and we talked about that earlier, how a lot of times the, these patterns are pretty messy and ugly. And that's just the way the fish like them. Yep. Yeah. Something yeah. that look, looks vulnerable to them. Um, yeah. as, as opposed to something that's very likely to fly away, that's yeah. fully formed and ready ready to get off the water. <clears throat> All right. Um, T.R. Raman, looking forward to, uh, sorry, any advice on tying a simple but effective scud pattern? Um, I just put up a pattern on my YouTube channel, the Dub Scud, a few weeks ago. And literally it's um, a hook, a little crystal flash tail, just because I think you got to put more, you got to complicate it somehow. And then uh, a little bit of wire and then dub a body out of seals for a rabbit for a squirrel, ice dub, whatever you want to use. Aggressively brush it down, trim it to look like a scud and you're done. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, really simple. And it, especially in smaller sizes, that really works well. Tim, anything you guys fish some scuds out in your waters out there and sow bugs, things like that. Yeah, I have one. It's a combination between like a last or, or um, a waltz worm. So sort of looks like a crane fly larva, but you yep. tie it on a curved shank hook and do exactly what you just said. You, you, you have big brushy body, you know, um, uh, either dubbing loop or split thread dubbing, just make the dubbing go crazy and then trim the back, trim the sides. And you have those little legs underneath and it could be anything. I mean, it could be a, a sow bug. It could be a scud. Just kind of a universally good pattern. Yeah, uh, lo yeah. love the things. Guide fly, uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, a question here: How to get hackles? Uh, how to? Sorry, I'll, I'll get. I'll, I'll learn to read in a minute. Uh, how to consistently get hackles tied in correctly so the fibers are sweeping back like a proper pumpkin head. For those who aren't familiar, pumpkin head, um, very popular pattern originated by a friend of mine, John Kent, is, is a variation of a woolly bugger. Um, I struggle getting them consistent. Uh, I know how I like to do it. Tim, how do you, uh, you know, I, I like to tie my hackle, all my woolly buggers in by tying the hackle in at the front uh, by the base, uh, you know, where, you know, the base of the feather, not the tip. And then right. wind it back over the body, hold it in place with a weight, typically a, pair of hackle pliers just to hold it once it's wound to hold it and then spiral wrap uh wire right through the the hackle and over the body to lock it in place and that always yeah. seems to work best for me i i'm pretty much the same way the only other little let me see if i can grab a feather out of here real quick the only other thing that i can think of my ear just fell off <laughs> <laughs> um let me just grab any one one of these guys in here. There's a beauty. Come on out of there. Um, I got my camera turned on. To to when when you do that, I'm not even going to use a. I can use a hook. What the heck? Just put it in there for reference. Um, to to make sure that it wraps correctly, and this this goes for kind of just about any hackle. Is I like to add when I strip the fibers down here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these fibers off, just get rid of them. Okay. And I can even snip this off to make sure that it wraps correctly. I'm going to take a few more. I have the shiny side of the feather facing me, the front of the feather. I'm going to take a few more just from the top. So when I get this sucker tied in, 
Probably should have done that first. That first... I'm not even going to trim that stem off, guys. You can pretend it's not there. See that, that blank spot that I've got there? When I go to wrap, that blank spot's going to want to come around and contact first, okay? And that's going to keep the shiny side facing forward. The other thing just doesn't really relate, but when I'm doing flies like this, I like to take two or even three flat wraps before I start doing open spirals. And what that does is it it helps to stop the, the fly from spinning uh, so much in the water. And, you know, uh, a lot of woolly buggers will, will spin like crazy in mm -hmm. the water. And it's because you've made a corkscrew, basically. Yeah. And yeah. so the flat wraps stop that from happening. Yeah, <clears throat> for the that's most great. part. That's a great tip. Uh, oh, good question for both of us from a friend of mine, Stephen Dexter. Tim and Phil, what is your most challenging material to tie with and why? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come first. Mine is our yeah, quills. You... Mine are quills. Duck quills, uh, turkey quills, and, and tying them like quill wings on a dry fly or a wet fly like a Royal Coachman um, or a you know tradition like a Blue Dunn you know, those traditional uh, wet flies with quill wings. Um, you know, I, I think part of me bug, that bugs me is they split. And, yeah. you know, after spending all that effort, and I remember talking to, to Mike Lawson, some of you may know him from uh, Idaho, fame, made the really, the no hackle was uh, one of the flies he used to like to really tie. And it's, it's a, it's, you know, it's a tail dubbing and, and two duck quill wings. And it's probably argue, it's the most difficult fly I've ever tried to tie and, and getting the wing because the wings also help support the fly and getting them to look beautiful and like a mayfly done they come out of the sides of the fly and kind of almost like elbows should support the fly on the surface and of course the first fish that chomps it just fuzzes it right up and mike says so what's the big deal right um <laughs> yeah. you know so big deal you know deer hair we tie with like a comparadon um it's already frayed up anyway and nobody seems to mind that but they sure get upset when their duck quills get upset but it's just like any material right tim you just got to practice with it and sort of you know get over your fear and and, and and tackle it and you can get the hang of it i just don't use it much so I, I tend to shy away from it i like the synthetics or the or the deer hair wings or elk hair wings those kind of things because it's it's also a, a factor of time and when i get out on the water get more flies done yeah i i think for those duck quill wings there you you have to have quite a bit of self-loathing in order to tackle those i mean it's just <laughs> yeah. and and then you you know you've married wings it's even worse oh, it's like double, yeah. doubling it but um the, the the one that i'd say and i i i'm gonna i'm gonna go with you i'm going with the quills yeah. <laughs> but um the, i i guess second in line just because so many flies use it and it can be so frustrating is deer and elk hair and mainly because it's so important the quality of the hair that you're using for the particular application and mm -hmm. having the right stuff is so so important and you could have the best technique tying technique in the world but if you're not using the correct hair uh, you're, you're going to have a terrible time doing it yeah. and the flies are not going to look as good and so i mean i have bags and bags and bags of deer hair that um, all different sizes and hollowness and is it coastal deer hair? Is it early season? Is yep. it is it a buck or is it a doe? Um, and particularly with elk, that matters a lot. And yep. so, um, yeah, it can be a very frustrating material, but I, I still use it a lot. Well, that dovetails into our next question. Um, hoping to demo the best, easiest way to work with deer hair and elk hair. I think you touched on it earlier with your dubbing, but maybe you can show... Um, just how to use dubbing to control that material yeah, that sure. the skin and and get out of out of hand because we also had a question about you know use you know tying a bomber for example as well about just getting a nice packed body when you're spinning yeah yeah yep. um let me see if i can find that patch of there's some deer hair uh like i said i i have a lot, a lot of deer hair and have talked to a talked to a lot of different people about it too and, and mm -hmm. you know what what hair is good for comparisons and uh what hair is good for muddlers and now a lot of companies are, are really breaking it down and, and you can buy muddler hair helps to helps you to figure it out spinning hair for making things like bombers yeah. uh, bombers and bugs and 
<clears throat> but then there's other stuff. This is actually a, a, a little bit of uh, elk. And then uh, body hair, deer body hair, totally different application. For me, for things like uh, uh, elk hair, caddis, CDC, and elk, the shorter stuff, less than an inch, is, is what I'm looking for in both elk as well as deer hair. And uh, I, I am going to plug one, one group of people in particular, uh, and that's Blue Ribbon Flies, Craig Matthews out in yes, West Yellowstone. beautiful stuff. Beautiful yeah, stuff. It, in there. You, yeah, you talk about <laughs> yeah. uh, art, artisanal fly tying materials. Yeah. <laughs> this stuff is amazing. Um, yeah, just, just ties really, really well. But let me show you. On I'm going to just, this hook is way too large. I'll just tie in a. You just need to switch your thing. Yep. I'm going to tie in a deer hair wing using using this stuff. But again, one of, one of the keys that I found to get it to seat the way I want it, because it's slippery material on a slippery hook shank is just, again, a little bit of dubbing. I'm going to use beaver fur here, which and just the tiniest, tiniest little amount and going to put it on my tying thread. I'll even make sure that that's it right there one little pinch you're you're done the body you're you're ready to tie in that that wing and just build up a little area here no one's gonna see it don't don't worry about it get your thread position kind of right in the middle i'm gonna grab just a little bit i'm not even gonna stack this stuff you don't want too much are you going to zoom in a little bit? Um, I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Man, oh, man. Sorry. Got the boss with him. <laughs> I, yeah, tough, tough room, Phil. Pro producers, wow. huh? Producers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, just yeah, just... <laughs> we're just the eye candy. <laughs> yeah. So what I like to do when I'm tying these these wings in, uh, like on an elk hair caddis, let me up just a weasel i i like to go like this and brace brace here and snip off the front okay and i kind of use the 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 hook as a measurement i'll snip there square it off move it to the back edge of the hook okay and then i go around once around again and then i pull toward me i'm pushing back here and it flares that hair but I think you'll see, I'm, I'm going to try to let go. Hopefully I won't make a liar out of me. I'm tugging on this thread and that stuff is not spinning around the hook shank. That's with a single or two, two wraps around there. No. Okay. And that's what that little bit of dubbing does. And then I'll just go through and, and then it's really locked into place. I'm a little too mm -hmm. far back from the hook eye, but but yeah. that's that's how I like to do it. And that again, that dubbing is just it's it's a secret weapon, and it well, works for so many things. That that's a great tip because, like you say, you also use it when you're using like uh, dumbbell eyes, right? Which are notorious yeah. for no matter you know. The, I think a lot of people default. Let's go use a GSP, you know, more thread pressure, and I can swing on it, and it the, the eyes still still the spin. End of all that still spin because you got two smooth surfaces you'll just go yeah, and, on each other and even adhesive even super glue or um yeah, it'll it, just it'll, break it, it'll break yeah, it, yeah it'll hold for a second but then it'll just just go and, and break and that that dubbing is the the stuff yeah really no, that's, that's a great i also noticed another great tip you did there you didn't is the you know i think a lot of times people they always go over the top of that material, any material with, you know, a reasonably firm wrap. And of course the torque of that, the material just, just wants to go, it. but yep. you went around once, twice. And now when you apply pressure, that thread just kind of goes boom, from all sides. Yeah, that material exactly. Cause it just squished and it can't move. So, the, you yep. know, the great, great tip there as well. Uh, getting near the end of the questions here. Um, I'm interested in learning about. Oh, wait a minute! I missed one here. Do you have a preferred method for tying a bee for beadhead pheasant tail nymphs? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the legs are the issue there. I think yeah. is what everybody's talk has I problems think so. with. Yeah, yeah, it's it's much easier to get the legs right when you don't have a bead in the way. But um, 
<clears throat> yeah, you you have your method, I think. Yeah, I I'm, and I've got I've got a the gold bead pheasant tail on my YouTube channel, but I basically from I try to use the longest for the tail and the body. I try to use choose a feather with the longest fibers I can, um, just because you know the easy, the longer it is, the easier it is to hold. But I, if I can, I like to tie in the tail, and then don't trim off the excess. Fold the remainder back, tie in my my wire. And then coat that shank with a little touch of super glue and then counterwind the remaining butts of the pheasant tail over the hook. And that um, super glue will help hold them down. If you lose your grip, a lot of times it won't even unravel or it'll unravel one turn because the super glue has gripped it enough. Tie that off and then wind the ribbing as you would normally any material away from yourself. And you get this kind of crisscross effect on the materials. And when you cinch the thread onto that wire, it's going to want to further tighten or rotate the wire around the, the body and then trim all that off. And then the trick I use for the legs is rather than trying to factor in, okay, I've got to form a wing case and then I've got to have a little bit extra to form a nice, even balanced pair of legs. I'll actually pre-measure the legs first. I want them, okay, I want them, and this is personal preference, maybe I want them to go back three quarters of the shank length. And so I'll tie that sitting in out front like this so the, the, that the tips of the feather sticking out are about three quarters of the shank length. And then I'll form my thorax out of the peacock curl. Then I'll fold those butts over from the, from the tips to form the wing case, trim that off, and then fold the divide and fold those uh, tips back to form the legs. And you get consistent uh, leg form, you know, get your legs formed consistently every time because you've pre-measured them. You're not kind of adding a little extra onto the... The, uh, the section you're going to use for the wing case, if that makes sense. If we had more yeah. time, we'd show it. If we had more time, yeah. but we've been here one thirty already, and I know Tim's. It's late back there, so. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, and I think Tim, you've got obviously you've got pheasant tail on your channel too as well. Yeah, yeah, a couple couple different variations yeah. of it, depending on whether whether the pheasant tail has a bead or not. The beads what usually cause the problem with the legs and, yeah. and the wing case, and then. You know, I have a smaller, like a micro pheasant tail that I'm really fond of as well. Um, but <clears throat> just uh, because I have one right here, happen yeah. to have one right here. The other thing to, to just with with pheasant tail uh, in particular is is the feathers, and there there yeah. are good ones and there are bad ones. This one, um, a, a friend of mine, uh, he just does amazing stuff uh, with with birds and 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 uh, and fur and but this is this, i would consider this almost a museum quality yeah, uh, ring, be... ring neck pheasant tail these fibers are so so long both sides yeah uh, pretty, pretty well even balanced yeah and you can see the tips there it's like the the bird was in its own pen or something <laughs> um that you know there every single tip is there which means the tips can be used uh, for legs, none of them are, are cut off, and and I don't I don't even want to take a, a, a <laughs> no that would be I have, a whole, <laughs> I have a whole peacock um, skin somebody gave me once uh, apparently a raccoon got to it and, and unfortunately killed the bird but didn't really mangle it up and so he skinned it out and I to this day still haven't used it it's just too beautiful to beautiful, use beautiful yeah <laughs> just yeah look at I, it. I don't, I don't thing. get many that is of these a, you, that may be the nicest pheasant tail I've ever seen and you'd only have yeah. to be a fly tire to look at that and, and, and appreciate, you know, appreciate that. I think everybody else on the planet would think we're all nuts uh, for getting <laughs> yeah. so excited over a, a, a pheasant, pheasant tail, but a uh, great tip, Tim. Um, for, yeah. Again, yes. all back to the quality of the materials, right? Whether that's yep. deer hair, pheasant tails, anything. It pays to, to be a, uh, you know, a, a, a frugal shopper with those things. Um, and a question here again about quality buying deer or elk hair. And we talked about this a little bit. You mentioned some of it. How do you choose the best ones for wings and spinning? Yeah, it's it. Golly, there, there's so much there. I, I really, I, I mean, that's about an hour, two hours worth yeah. of discussion. And uh, uh, Tom Rosenbauer and I have had it before on the materials yeah. and, uh, it's really looking for length of the hair. If you if you're doing compare duns, things like that, muddler minnows, um, a lot of stuff in that range. Go go for hair that's uh, less than an inch in length. That yeah. that would be a real good way to get it locked down. Also, when when you're looking at hair, um, 
this stuff, I, I, it, it's beautiful hair. Don't get, get get me wrong, but um, I I like the tips to be fairly well aligned, and these yes. are th these are really not. You have those mm -hmm. those errant ones sticking out, whereas I think it's this one, um, remarkably even tips. Okay, mm -hmm. the other thing you can just barely see it here on on the very tips. There's a lot of black. Okay. Yeah. See it there? And yep. if you're tying really small flies, you think you're tying in this light colored wing and it's down here, it's all black. And so yep. you, you, you want to be aware of how long those black tips are on a, on a particular specimen. This one's obviously bleach. So, but a uh, very, very ho more hollow hair. Um, yep. All, all these three will, will work um, for, you know, muddler head to a certain extent, but for things like comparaduns, uh, where it works really well. Elk care caddis, they'll, they'll, they'll work. Uh, I guess that's the biggest tip I can give. Keep it under an inch in length. The hair. Yeah. I know when I, um, you know, I used to work for a fly time materials distributor. Uh, a lot of the like to spin the big bass bugs and stuff like that. They really love the, the deer belly hair. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to get. Uh, very, but, uh, very hollow yeah. and uh, maybe we'll have to have you back we'll do a deer hair night one night we'll be here for uh, yeah time. we would <laughs> yeah. and last oh a couple of last questions here um interested in learning about fly per, uh, fly proportions for example length of tails for nymphs any tricks uh, tips or tricks for tying hackle collars on nymphs and wet flies especially working with partridge so the collar doesn't extend too far past the hook bend and i think you did some of your Orvis tips on this specific issue about um, tail length and particularly uh, hackle length on, with using partridge and how to how to uh, get the best out of each feather. Yeah, and I, I urge you guys, just so we're not here till uh, two o'clock in the morning um, to 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 go and it it um, I have a whole series. I think there are four videos all together on using larger feathers uh, and and how to how to shorten them. And uh, the bunch of techniques in those 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 one minute. Yep. Um, it's a, you know it would be a little little long to run through those here. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the tail length and stuff like on jigs now, I, to me it's a lot. Gosh, I'm gonna show my age. It's a lot yeah. like uh, hemlines on dresses. You know, the, it's seasonal. It it yeah. seems to change. And right now, uh, it's amazing the comp guys with the little CDL tails. They're, yeah. they're barely a hook gap in length. I mean, they're just these yeah. stubby little things. And uh, I'm not sure what they actually accomplish, but uh, <laughs> that, that's where they are now. And uh, long tails kind of look a little funny. Uh, yeah, and, and yet uh, funny, in a lot of the Stillwater stuff, sometimes I'll go a little longer on like if I'm using a marabou um, for a damsel tail or something. Because we don't have the current, um, the, the longer it is, the more supple it tends to be and more it moves and wiggles and suggests life, right? So yeah. I think it's interesting, the application and the environment you're going to use that in. Okay, last question, number 30 here. The F-Fly has a tail or no? Comparing Phil's picture to Tim's video. Oh, <laughs> Throwdown, so, huh? Yeah. Wow. That's, oh, that's good. No, that's Jeez, a great that's question. That's way to Jill. end the night. No, that's a good question. Um, the, the fly Jill is referring to on my YouTube channel. I've just my most recent upload is a a, a CDC um um uh, F fly calibatus. So it 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 broke the mold a little bit because the original F fly or Fratnik midge was a really tiny fly with just a body and a and a CDC wing. That was it, and just a yeah. deadly little fly. And I just enlarged it um, for fishing calibatus because. That's a mayfly species up here. They're, they can be as big as 12s, most often 14, 16 sometimes, sometimes 18s. And I just put the tails on because it's a mayfly done and they have tails. And just to give that larger fly a little bit more support when it sits on the water. But the original fly, as Tim, you've shown on your channel, had no tail. No yeah. tail. And it's I, I believe anyway that uh, Mr. Frotnick wanted that body to sink below the water surface yeah. and that the, the wing rides flush in in the in the surface film. And yeah. to, to me, those flies, whether whether it's the F fly or um, Charlie Craven uh, has a fly called the mole fly. The and mole it's, fly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Imagine uh, an F fly, but the wing pointing forward out over it's the like that shuttlecock. Yeah. It's like that. Yeah, shuttlecock. It, it is a shuttlecock essentially. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, 
So uh, two two just dynamite flies that that look like an insect that's you know poking out of the water, but the body's hanging down below and and vulnerable, ready ready to be eaten. Uh, yeah. Easy meal. You're you're well, hearing Jimmy, our cat in the background, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it's his <laughs> last call. Last call. Yep. Um, no, it's bedtime. It's, again, Tim, it's been great having you on here. Um, we got a couple of things left to do, though. We had 30 questions, and as a, to encourage getting those questions, you're always worried. I don't know about you, Tim, but you you put it out there. Please ask a question, and it's just yeah, crickets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crickets. <laughs> but we got lots of great questions, and and Tim, it was so you know your videography just added just an air of polish. This is probably my no disrespect to my previous guests, but this has arguably been the best one I've ever done because of what you were able to show um, with uh, your setup there. Um, so we're, we had 30 questions where I'm going to use a uh, randomizer, a number generator, and run it in from 1 to 30. So just I'm going to share screen here. Uh, just find the tab number generator so everybody can see that. So we had 30. And then I just push the generate button. And question number three is the winner of the... Um, um, uh, Canadian Llama um, materials package, which we'll get out, and that's uh, Frank Dial. So, Frank, uh, congratulations! And that was Frank's question was on, uh, and Tim, you did a great job explaining that was on showing how to use split thread dubbing. So, um, that that's that's great. Um, yeah. So, um, again, thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you've got any uh, future subjects you'd like to see, tying. I also do Lake Talk live events where we talk more you know, actual fishing techniques and tactics. My goal is to try and do at least one a month, maybe two. Um, so I've got some great guests lined up as well um, for that. Um, I'm, I believe we'll definitely have Tim back if you'll, if you'll have me. Um, uh, I'd love to come back. Phil. Yeah, That'd be yeah, and we can, we can maybe even make it a, a little more focused. Maybe it's a deer hair night or something. Yeah. Um, so we can really uh, even get more into that. And again, this event is being recorded. So if you came in halfway through or had to leave, of course, if you have to leave, you're not here anymore. But <laughs> anyway, you can uh, watch it. It will be on both my uh, Facebook, uh, Phil Rooley Fly Fishing Facebook channel and my YouTube channel for you to watch later. And again, thank you, everyone, for watching. Went a little longer than usual, one hour and 41 minutes. But uh, it's been a great night. And again, Tim, I can't thank you enough for being here. So goodbye, everyone. Stay safe. and. Uh, Tim, we'll, we'll probably see each other at uh, upcoming fly fishing shows. I, I hope so, Phil, and thank and you very much for meeting. doing this. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Let's do it again. Anytime. See you guys.